In this episode, we're going to deal with the first six months of F.W. de Klerk's presidency, six months that began to change South Africa. F.W. de Klerk, you were elected a president by the caucus on the 14th of September, and then you were inaugurated on the 20th of September, I think in the, in the student church at the University of Pretoria. Correct. What were you fe your feelings when you entered that church and when you were confronted with the enormous responsibility of leading South Africa through this tumultuous period? I was feeling very humble. I was deeply under the impression of the magnitude of the task ahead of me. But I was calm because I, have, I didn't have to look for a new vision. During the late 80s, I've come to certain conclusions. And I had a fairly clear vision in my mind about what we needed to do. So I was sure of myself that we we're on the right path, I believed it, and that we had five years within which to do it. And I promised not only to myself, but through the oath that I took to serve the country honestly, openly, and with a view to change South Africa into what we call a new South Africa. Now, one of your first tasks as president would, of course, be to put your government together. So you had to appoint a cabinet. Can you tell us something about the team that you appointed? Who were your strongest supports? Uh, to whom did you look for advice? Well, most of the old cabinet was there. But I felt that we needed some expertise. So in my first cabinet, I appointed Dr. Wim de Villiers, one of the top industrialists until his retirement in South Africa. Later on, not much later, I appointed uh, Derek Keyes as Minister of Finance and uh, a Minister of Housing from the... Louis Schill. Louis Schill as Minister of Housing. So I brought in some expertise from outside, which wasn't, of course, very popular with, within those who aspired for cabinet posts, but I did it. I believed in cabinet government and started to demolish the securocrat structures which PW had surrounded himself with and promoted open and free debate in cabinet. I stopped the habit of seeing ministers individually, granting them their wishes, and then, as president, promoting that myself in cabinet. I said, no, bring your story to cabinet, and cabinet will decide. It, it worked well, and we restored full cabinet ruling as it should be done in any fully democratic country. What about advisors like Dr. Gerrit Verleun? What role did you see that he would play in the, in the road ahead? Well, Gerrit Verleun was a brilliant man. He was taken out of the university life by PW when he appointed him as, uh, as the top administrator of Southwest Africa, as we then called Namibia and brought him into cabinet. And I relied on him very heavily. He was close to me. I picked him to actually, from a cabinet point of view, from a ministerial point of view, lead the negotiation process. And you began to clear the decks for negotiations at a very early stage in your presidency. And one of the first decisions you took was to permit peaceful demonstrations in South Africa's major cities. And this, I think, came as a bit of a shock to some of your security advisors. Why did you do that and, and what was the reaction? Yes, it did come as a big shock. They were very much against it. They were very worried that it might evolve into and explode into violent situations. But 
internationally and universally. In true democracies, the right to protest is acknowledged. And I wanted to prove by doing that, that yes, we're not busy with superficial changes. These changes are fundamental. But I wasn't reckless about the risk of violence and, and rioting. I started the negotiation process with the organizers of such protests. And we agreed upon the routes they would take. And we agreed upon the steps they would take to prevent violence and to keep such protests peaceful. And that succeeded. It worked. And it was a first step in removing doubt about our real intentions. Did you have any interaction with leaders of the UDF, like uh, Archbishop Tutu and uh, Alan Bussack, or was this done r remotely? Not much. I wanted to see Archbishop Tutu, but at that stage he refused to, to see me. But uh, through, through other channels, yes, there were communication, but not me directly. And the next major step was, was your decision to re release all of the remaining uh, uh, high-profile political leaders, ANC leaders who were still in prison those who had been uh, ar arrested at the Rivonia. What was, what was the thinking around that? And again, what was the reaction of, of your colleagues and of the security establishment? I realized, and we all realized, that Nelson Mandela would have to be released at some time or another. And the one motivation for the release of the other Rivonia trial people was to put our toe in the water, to see what reaction would that have internally in South Africa? How would that go down? Our second motivation was to ensure that once again, we show that we mean what we say when we say we're going to normalize things, that we're not busy with superficial changes that we are up to and we're going to embark on a road of fundamental change. Mandela, by the way, I was told, was happy with the release and, and accepted that he wouldn't be released at the same time. But you did decide to meet with Mandela. And I think on the 13th of December, Nelson Mandela was brought to your office, Tonehouse in Cape Town through the basement by Neil Barnard and uh, Kubi Kutsia and General Willemse. And you met, the, you met Nelson Mandela for the first time. W what were your impressions? Nelson Mandela was taller than I thought. He had an impressive presence. There was an aura of dignity around him, which impressed me from the beginning. And there was a readiness to speak and to openly discuss things. So my first impression of him was a good one. That yes, the reports that I got about the talks about talks which he had with Neil Barnard, with Kobe Kutsier, with General Willemso, with Van der Merwe from Home Affairs, from Justice, that yes, those reports were true we could do business with each other. He later wrote in his autobiography, A Long Walk to Freedom, that also he evaluated me that evening and came away afterwards feeling, I can do business with this man. So we laid a sort of a, a platform, albeit not a very firm platform, but a platform for good relations and for open interaction with each other right from the beginning. All of this presaged a completely new approach to government in South Africa. Previously, before you became president, the accent had been on security. You had taken the decision to dismantle the pervasive national management system and to reduce but not eliminate the role of the State Security Council. 
What was the response of the security establishment to these moves? Well, I was very worried about it because I knew many of, in the lower ranks especially, voted for the Conservative Party, were against my policies. So I was taking a risk with them. But I felt I could rely on the top echelon of the security forces to be true to their task and to the mandate that they had from our then constitution. So I pressed ahead to dismantle the big securocrat grouping that PW assembled around himself and said, yes, there would be a security council, but its function would be like that of another or other cabinet committees. And uh, that everything must come to cabinet and that main decisions shouldn't be sort of worked out by, the, by a security council which dominated the cabinet, which it was doing during PW's time. And you, you also took the decision to address the leadership core of the South African police at one meeting and the leadership core of the South African Defence Force at another. What was your objective there and what did you tell them? My objective was to tell them that the time where they are asked to be involved in politics is over. That they are to return to their basic tasks. In the case of the police, to protect the lives and property of all South Africans. In the case of the Defence Force, to protect the borders of South Africa and the international security of South Africa. And what sort of reaction did you, did you receive from them at those meetings? When I spoke, it wasn't enthusiastic. It was to be not a secret, but it was to be confidential. But in my address to the police, somebody must have taped me and leaked it to the press. So what happened was that everything I said was published in the newspaper. It was good that it happened in retrospect because it proved that even when I spoke in confi in, with confidentiality to people, I was saying the same things I was saying outside in public. Now also momentous things were happening in the rest of the world. On the, uh, on, on the 9th of November 1989, the Berlin Wall was uh, broken down. Uh, history was changing. This must have had an impact on the way you were thinking, particularly with regard to the deep-seated threat that the South African Communist Party had always posed, and also the great threat of Soviet intrusion in Southern Africa. What, what was your reaction to the fall of the Berlin Wall? It is doubtful that I would have been able to make the speech that I made on the 2nd of February 1990 if the Berlin Wall didn't come down. For decades, the USSR was a threat to South Africa. They were supporting the ANC and other freedom movements. They had a strategy to expand their influence over the whole of Southern Africa because of our strategic position and because of our minerals. They had action plans to bring the old dispensation to its knees and to make a communist region of the whole of Southern Africa. It wasn't a question of reds under beds. There was a real communist threat. When communism imploded with the coming down of the Berlin Wall, it opened a window of opportunity. I and my fellow cabinet members saw the window and we jumped through it. And that enabled me to go much further in my 2nd of February 1990 speech than I would have been able to do otherwise. Now, these were exciting times. The Berlin Wall had fallen. Uh, 
you'd met Mandela, uh, the things were beginning to move in South Africa after so many, so many years of tension and struggle. You then convened um, a Bosporada, Bush conferences with the leadership of the, the National Party to discuss the road ahead. Uh, at at, at Dinyala, I think, uh, near the Botswana border. Can you tell us about those meetings and, and what discussions took place and what was the atmosphere? At all times, a leader must take his constituency along with him or herself. And the boss Barada was there to ensure that we all stayed on the same page, to give each member of the cabinet and each leader of the National Party the full opportunity to put forth their views, to argue it through, to oppose what I was saying, to create an atmosphere of free debate in an effort to find consensus. And so there were discussions which cut through to the bone, very deep cutting discussions. And then it was my task as leader to sum up a consensus at the end. And fortunately, at that Bosbarat of December 1989, and at other Bosbarat, my consensus definition was accepted. And I took along even the most right-wing thinking people in the cabinet to support what I was going to do and what I was doing and trying to do. And that uh, consensus that emerged from these meetings then became the framework for your 2nd of February speech. Absolutely. Uh, uh, you wrote that speech yourself, I think, toward the end of January 1990. Uh, can you tell us about the writing process? How did that work? Well, of course, uh, a president's speech opening of parliament speeches usually uh, done through input from departments about their activities. So I didn't write the whole speech. The sp speech dealing with finance, speech dealing with, I wrote the part of the lifting of the bans on all parties on the release of all political prisoners, on the lifting of the states of emergency, those parts which made the big world news and international news, I wrote myself. It was based, yes, on the consensus we reached. But I didn't clear the speech with anybody until very late in the process. I used some ministers because of their intimate knowledge, uh, Pakbota and others to also make inputs when the speech was constructed. I then finalized a version. I then got that small inner circle's support for it. I then finalized the speech and two days before I delivered it, I called cabinet together, gave them the full speech to reach, to read, and said, now, on the basis that this is kept absolutely secret, that we don't even tell our wives about it, do I have your support for this, yes or no? The cabinet read through it, and I had unanimous support of the cabinet for making the speech as I delivered it. And it was a... Uh, it was, uh an exciting time in South Africa. There were huge expectations uh, around the world because of the fact that you'd become president, you'd, you'd made all of these important decisions to allow peaceful demonstrations to release Robben Island prisoners, and there was a huge expectation in South Africa and in the international media that you were about to release Nelson Mandela. So we had more foreign media in South Africa at the beginning of February 1990 than at any other time in our history. We had some of the big networks broadcasting their news from South Africa. 
We had all of the big personalities here. So this was going to be a moment when the world's attention would be focused on Parliament on, and on F.W. de Klerk. I think there were huge differences between the manner in which you managed your 2nd of February speech and the way that P.W. Boerter had managed his Rubicon speech. Yes, we decided at all costs to keep the announcements, the package I announced, secret until I delivered the speech. My cabinet stuck to their words and there was no leak. We also decided not to make the main news the release of Mandela. Yes, to say he will be released shortly, but I will later make an announcement about that. So that the focus could be on the far-reaching steps that I announced on that day. The unbanning of parties and the rest. We succeeded in that. All those important people had to stay on to wait for when would I announce now the release of Mandela. And we did that a few days afterwards. And how did you feel personally when you went to Parliament that day, when you stood up and made the speech? And what was the re response and reaction of, of the other parties in Parliament? Well, on my way in, I said to my wife then, Marika, South Africa will never be the same again. I believed in what I was doing. So I was calm and deliberate. My first step after the speech was to call my caucus together because the speech has not been cleared with them and to ensure that I have their support. The other parties all supported it. It included the parties from the, you remember we then had a three-chamber cha three parliament, but the conservative party was in absolute shock. I was immediately called a traitor and Trernich, the leader of the Conservative Party, immediately called for a new election. At that point, we will leave this episode, one of the central promises of the F.W. de Klerk speech of the 2nd of February was that the door was being opened to negotiations with the genuine representatives of all of the people of South Africa for a new constitution. In our next episode, we will discuss the beginning of that process.